Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher. I'm back again with another historical video. And today, we are continuing on our revolution, our French Revolution um, extravaganza, if you want to call it that. Uh, and today, we're going to be talking about that short guy, Napoleon. So uh, let's let's get into it. Let's talk about Napoleon. All right, so uh, spoiler alert, there are a lot of slides. However, what I want to say, um, there, there are a lot of pictures, so be aware. That's all I got to say. All right, so we got a long title, The Rise of Napoleon and the Napoleonic Wars. Chapter 4, Lesson 3, we're almost... We're almost done with this this uh, French Revolution business. Okay, that was your warm up. All right, so we're going to identify Napoleon's role in the French Revolution and then describe how the revolution changed France. All right, so a short backstory. <laughs> Get it? Because he, because he's short. Uh, I grew up. Uh, being told that Napoleon was actually 5'4". Uh, turns out that I think it was uh, France had a different scale of how they measured people. Um, obviously, because as we learned last lecture, they, they changed the months, right? Um, so I, I would imagine they did had different measurements for people back then too. But it turns out he's just 5'6". He's just and I think normal average human beings are like five seven so he's not that short as he as he was in the way i learned it so there you go anyways napoleon's role in the french revolution is complex in one sense he brought it to an end when he came to power in 1799 yet he was also a product of the revolution as well without it he would have never risen to power, and he himself never failed to remind the French that he persevered the best parts of the revolution during his reign of power as emperor. Uh, he was born in Corsica, which is the island uh, off of the coast of Italy and France, um, in between. Uh, and only it was only a few months after France had been annexed by the island. His father came from minor nobility in Italy, but the family was not rich. Napoleon was talented and uh, will win eventually a scholarship to a famous military school in France. When he completed his studies, Napoleon was commissioned as a lieutenant in the French army. There were a few signs of his future success at this stage. He spoke with an Italian accent and wasn't popular among his fellow officers. But Napoleon devoted himself to his goals. He read the French philosophes uh, and what they had to say about reason. And he studied famous military campaigns. When the revolution took off and war with Europe came about, there were many opportunities for Napoleon to use his knowledge and skills. So that's a young Napoleon. Kind of looking like Jimmy Butler's haircut. Uh, and, oh man, I had such a hard time trying to find um, the the correct order in the army um but here you got lieutenant uh so he's an officer so he is an officer in the french army um and the lowest of the low if you can re read french uh you know this is a cadet was that soldat day something day french all right, so some success and defeat. Uh, Napoleon rose quickly to the ranks in 1792, the three years into the revolution. He became captain two years later at age 24. The Committee of Public Safety made him a brigadier general. Where is that? So he was a captain and a brigadier general. We'll say, is that chef de bataillon? He, he he rose up because he's short. Get it? 
So in 1796, he became the commander of the French armies in Italy. There, Napoleon will win a series of battles with speed, surprise, and decisive action. He also defeated the armies of the Papal States and their Austrian allies. If you remember, Austria is where Marie Antoinette was from. So, you know, France, Austria, brutal enemies. Uh, these victories will give France control of northern Italy. Throughout this, these Italian campaigns, Napoleon's energy and initiative earned him devotion of his troops, his personal qualities, and his charisma allowed him to win support of the people around him. In 1797, he returned back to France, a beloved hero. He was given command of an army in training, ready to invade Britain, who was France's frenemy. But Napoleon knew that the French couldn't carry out such an invasion and suggested to strike Britain indirectly by taking Egypt. Egypt is on the route to India, one of Britain's most important colonies, a major source of its wealth. So if you take Egypt, you're, you're hurting the British. The British, however, were a great sea power and controlled the Mediterranean waters, so good luck trying to get across. Uh, and by 1799, the British had defeated the French naval forces supporting Napoleon's army in Egypt, so with defeat certain, Napoleon abandons his army and returns to Paris. But not a lot of word got out about this uh, because Napoleon was uh, strict to limit the press and what they could produce. Um, so they didn't know that he had a big blunder in Egypt. Um, this is Captain Napoleon. This is one of the, his Egyptian campaigns. All right. New government, new leader. So in Paris, Napoleon took part of the coup of 1799, overthrew, look at that, that rhymes, the directory and set up a new government, the consulate. In theory, it was a republic, but in fact, Napoleon held absolute power. Napoleon was called the first consul, a title borrowed from ancient Rome. He appointed officials, controlled the army, conducted foreign affairs, and influenced legislature. In 1802, Napoleon was made consul for life. Two years later, 1804, he crowned himself Emperor Napoleon I. So the consulate, so it's, it goes, you know, the 12 man directory of the Committee of Public Safety, and then it goes to the Constitution 795, and then it goes to the directory. The directory was a five man a group of people in charge, and then Napoleon has his coup, and the consulate is these three, and Napoleon's in the middle. And then Napoleon just declares himself emperor. So, you know, he's emperor. Um, hopefully I showed this, will show this in class. That is, This is the new Napoleon video or video, the new Napoleon movie coming out during Thanksgiving. Um, so I highly suggest it. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix is um, Napoleon. Uh, I'm not going to play this because your boy doesn't need to get copyrighted. All right, so religion fixed. Uh, one of Napoleon's first moves at home was to establish peace with the Catholic Church. If you remember the de-Christianization by Robespierre, the... Um, civil constitution of the clergy, um, the church coming under control of the state. A lot of things happened to the Catholic church. So in matters of religion, Napoleon was a man of the enlightenment. He believed in reason and felt religion was at most a social convenience. However, since most of France was Catholic, it was a good idea to mend these relations with the church. So in 1801, Napoleon came to an agreement with the Pope, which recognized Catholicism as the major religion of a majority of the French people. In return, the Pope would not ask for the return of church lands that were seized during the Revolution, and with this agreement, the Catholic Church, CC, was no longer an enemy of the French government. It also meant that people who acquired these church lands in the Revolution would become avid supporters of Napoleon because Napoleon let them keep their land. What a nice guy. Uh, I'm assuming this is supposed to be Napoleon um, because he's got a crown about to be put on his head. Um, again, 
this is the Pope because that's his hat. Uh, this is the car the cardinals are like the the ones below the pope um and so they wear red all right the code so napoleon's most famous domestic achievement was to codify france's laws before the revolution france had almost 300 different legal systems that's crazy uh, during the revolution, efforts were made to prepare for a single law code for the entire nation, but this work wouldn't be complete until Napoleon came back to power. However, from 300, Napoleon um, set it down to seven new law codes were created, but the most important was the Civil Code, or what's widely known in history as the Napoleonic Code, introduced in 1804. It preserved many of the principles revolutionaries had fought for quality of citizens before the law, the right of an individual to choose a profession, the religious toleration, and the abolition of serfdom and all feudal obligations. So remember how I told you when, if you were a French peasant, you had to pay a tax. Remember those taxes? Remember that that worksheet? You know, um, how many pounds was it? 40, 40 pounds of oats? 60 pounds of oats? Or was it 60 kilograms? 100 what was that 132 pounds of oats? Remember that? Um, so in order to use like the wine press to make, you know, wine with your grapes or uh, to ground uh, the use the mill, you had to pay the Lord the tax. OK, all that's gone now. Uh, for women and children, however, the civil code was a step back during the radical stage of the revolution. New laws made divorce easier and allowed children, even daughters, to inherit property on an equal basis. The civil code, however, undid these laws. <laughs> Women were now, quote, less equal than men. Great. When they married, they lost control over any property they had. Jeez. They couldn't testify in court, and it became more difficult for them to begin divorce proceedings. So preventing someone to go to court is going to eliminate the possibility of being divorced by a woman because well they can't they can't go inside the doors in general the code treated women like children who they said needed protection and who did not have a public role that's the napoleonic code sorry it's pixelated i thought this picture would look bigger better bigger it did not all right, revolutionary preserver, question mark. Uh, in his domestic uh, policies, Napoleon did keep some of his major reforms of the French Revolution under the Civil Code. All citizens were equal before the law. The concept of opening government to careers to more people was another gain of the revolution that he had retained. But Napoleon destroyed some revolutionary ideas. Liberty was replaced with despotism. Remember, that's being elected um, and then abusing that power. As um, it grew increasingly arbitrary, in spite of protests by such citizens as prominent writer and Louise Germain de Stahl, Napoleon uh, will shut down 60 of France's 73 newspapers and banned books, including de Stahl's. He insisted that all manuscripts be subjected to government scrutiny before they were published, and even the mail was opened by the government police. So um, there was such thing as freedom of the Freedom of press, and um, when you can't say what you want to say, but the people in the Enlightenment got to say what they wanted to say, think about it. If you're a man of the Enlightenment, that's Germain de Stahl. All right, builder of empires. So, um, in uh, Napoleon became consul in 1799. France was at war with the European coalition of Russia, Great Britain, and Austria. Napoleon then realized the need for a pause in the war. So in 1802, a peace treaty was signed, but it didn't last long. War will break out with Britain again in 1804. Gradually, Britain would be joined by Austria, Russia, Sweden, and Prussia. In a series of battles at Ulm, Austerlitz, Jena, and Eylau, from 1805 to 1807, Napoleon's Grand Army defeated the Austrian, Prussian, and Russian armies. From 1807 to 1812, Napoleon was the master of Europe. Master. Master. 
His grand empire was composed of three major parts, the French Empire, the dependent states, and the allied states. The French Empire consisted of a large France, extending to the Rhine River in the east and extending to the western half of Italy, north of Rome. Dependent states were kingdoms ruled by relatives of Napoleon. So Spain, Holland, the Kingdom of Italy, the Swiss Republic, the Grand Duchy of Warsaw, and the Confederation of the Rhine, which he created, included all of the German states or except Russia, Austria, and Prussia. They were all relatives. Mainly, he put his brother, uh, Joseph, on the seat of Spain. The Allied states were countries defeated by Napoleon and then forced to join the struggle against Britain. So these states included Prussia, Austria, Russia, and Sweden. So here are some battles um, and the maps about the battle. So this is the Battle of Ulm, 1805. Uh, blue is French, red is Austrian. Here's a painting of it. This is the Battle of Austerlitz, 1805. Again, red, uh, the Allies, blue, France. Here's a painting. There's Napoleon in the middle. Got to be in the middle, man. Uh, the Battle of Jena, October eight, uh, 1806. Again, Prussians, this time, against the blue French. Napoleon. I think he made that hat very famous. And then um, the Battle of Eylau. I believe this is like Eastern Germany. It's Russians and Russians and Prussians against the French. And here's a, a famous charge by Napoleon. So this is this is France under Napoleon in 1812. So you have blue being that empire, right? And it extends a little bit down here. Western uh, Italy, the Rhine River. Okay, up here, remember he, the French army conquered Austria and Netherlands. So French dependency or client state is light blue, which is the Confederation of the Rhine, the Grand Duchy of Warsaw, the Kingdom of Spain, Right, uh, the Kingdom of Naples, the Kingdom of Italy, those are his his uh dependents. The Allies, eighteen twelve, are the the like blue green. So Austria, Prussia, Nor Norway. Okay, and then territories under the coalition control. Uh, where's orange? I don't see orange. Maybe this stuff. It's interesting. Ba, 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 ba. Yeah. So the French Empire extends just out here. So France grows just a little bit. Okay, this is Corsica, right? This is where he was born. Here's a better better way to look at it. You got France in the dark blue, and then the, the dependents are here. And then the Allies, Prussia, Austria, Norway. Reverse, reverse. So with his empire, Napoleon sought to spread some of uh, the principles of the French Revolution, like legal equality, religious toleration, and economic freedom, the inner core, and dependent states of his grand empire. That's what it was called, the grand empire. Napoleon tried to destroy the old order. The old order is nobility and the clergy. Um, and everywhere in these states, those people lost their special privileges. Napoleon decreed equality of opportunity with offices open to those with ability, equality before the law, and religious toleration. The spread of revolutionary principles was an important factor in the development of liberal traditions in many of these countries. Napoleon hoped his grand empire would last for centuries, but his empire collapsed as fast as it was quickly formed. Uh, two major reasons, uh, Britain's ability to resist, resist Napoleon and this new force called nationalism, a.k.a. pride in your country. So in spite of him being a military genius and having a powerful army, Napoleon was never able to conquer Great Britain. Great Britain was able to hold off Napoleon at, at, and put him at bay due to its sea power, which made its 
almost invulnerable. Uh, Napoleon hoped to invade Britain, but the British defeated the combined French and Spanish fleet at Trafalgar. That's how you pronounce it, Trafalgar, off the coast of Spain in 1805. This battle permanently weakened his navy and ended any plans Napoleon might have had for an invasion. So unable to defeat the British at sea, Napoleon then turned to his new continental system in an effort to defeat the island nation. He's an island boy. The aim of the continental system test question, and on your midterm question, was to stop British goods from reaching European continent to be sold there. So it's kind of like a trade embargo. By weakening Britain economically, in theory, Napoleon N would destroy its ability to wage war. Because we know wars cost what? Uh, however, the continental system also failed. Allied states resented being told by Napoleon that they could not trade with the British. Some will begin to cheat. Others resisted. Newer markets will open in the Middle East and Latin America that gave Britain new outlets to sell their goods. And by 1810, British overseas exports were at near record high. So, did it really work out there, Napoleon? Oh. Uh, here's the Battle of Trafalgar. Here's a map of it. The continental system, in theory, would prevent goods from Britain entering Europe. All right, love your country. Uh, a significant factor, the de- it was the second significant factor in the defeat of Napoleon was nationalism, one of the most important forces of the 19th century. Nationalism, a sense of unique identity of a people based on a common language, religion, and national symbols. A new era was born when the French people decided that they were a new nation. So Napoleon marched his armies through the Germanic states, Spain, Italy, and Poland, arousing new ideas of nationalism in two ways. First, the conquered peoples became united in their hatred of their invaders, the French, and banded together to resist the conquerors. I just put together, together. Together forever. Uh, And second, the conquered peoples saw that the power and strength they had of a national feeling is pretty awesome when they work together. So, this is not a lesson lost on them or their rulers. So, nationalism. So, it's like bringing these ideas of revolution that they got from France, right? And in these places where they invaded and took over, they spread those revolutionary ideas to then have the people of Spain, Germany, or the Confederation of the Rhine, Poland, Italy, Italian people all band together because they hate what the French are doing. So they're going to kick the French out. And this is where, like, nationalism, pride in one's country, love for one's country, really actually hurts Napoleon. Because people didn't like him. And that's it. Whew. I know I talked pretty fast, but it is what it is. Uh, and, yeah, uh, that concludes this lecture. I mean, there's only 10 slides, I think. There are only 10 slides. So hopefully hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, you learned a little bit more about Napoleon. And uh, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about the end of Napoleon. Anyways, um, your homework is page 155, questions 3 and 4. All right. So page 155, questions 3 and 4. So yeah, hopefully you guys did enjoy that. If you did, make sure you hit that like button, leave a comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.